guest today was born and brought up in Grand Bank, Newfoundland. He is a graduate of Memorial University, and he liked Memorial so much he ended up making a career there as an archivist. Along the way, he managed to find time to write a column for the Telegram, to be the chair of the board of the Resource Center for the Arts, and most recently, I know, that he uh, provided a great service to Gower Street United Church by writing biographies of the many members of Gower Street United Church who served in the Great War. It's my pleasure to welcome to the program Mr. Bert Riggs. Hello, Bert. Hello, Carl. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, I'm you're delighted most welcome, to be sir. Here. And it's great to see you again. Now, Bert, let's talk about Grand Bank. What was it like growing up in Grand Bank in the 1960s? It was quite a different time than growing up in Grand Bank today. I was thinking about it and the thing that sticks in my mind most was how busy the harbor was. Mm -hmm. There was the Bonavista Coal Storage Fresh Frozen Fish Plant which had a number of in the beginning side trawlers but later the first stern trawler in Newfoundland, the Grand Monarch. There was still uh, masted schooners going to the, the deep sea fishery and there was an inshore fishery. And one of the things that, that I remember very fondly from my growing up was in the summertime, uh, because <clears throat> uh, Newfoundlanders, as you are fully aware, referred to the noontime meal as dinner, mm -hmm. the six o'clock meal as supper, and the one before you go to bed as lunch. That's right. <laughs> right. So I would come in around 11.30 or so and my mother would say, go down and see if anybody's in. And she gave me 50 cents. And then 50 cents was a single coin. <clears throat> and uh, that meant to go down and see if any of the inshore fishermen had come in and to buy a fish, a 50 cent worth fish, fresh, gutted, but head still on for my father's dinner. Mm -hmm. And usually there was, and I would bring it home. And my mother, you know, she died a little over two years ago. No, under two years ago, at the age of nine, almost 99. But she was beyond and ahead of her time because she seldom fried anything, and there was no salt shaker on our table. <laughs> she salted the food to the degree that she felt was necessary, and that was it. And a fresh cod was steamed with potatoes and onions in the oven. And my mouth waters whenever I think of that. I bet, yeah. That's part of it. I went through the old United Church school system from K to eight, then went off to John Burke, where I had a very productive three years. Uh, during my middle year, I was elected editor of the school newspaper, so there's one of my first um, mm introductions to writing other than schoolwork and the editor was none other than the lieutenant governor of newfoundland judy hood oh, she I and see. i became great friends at that time and have yes. remained so ever since i left to go to university and except for the ne the following summer after my first year i've not been there any more than for you know short vacations in the last mm. what, 40 almost 50 years mm. Where did your uh, where did your love of uh, literature and history and and writing come from? Do you think was it was it inherited? What, what was Part your father it, a great reader? Your mother? My mother was a great reader, uh, but it was my own insatiable urge for information. Uh, mainly, I read an awful lot. Like we had that world history in grades ten and eleven, the big red book you may remember. I do. Yeah. And we did half of it in grade 10 and half of it in grade 11. Well, by the end of the first month I had, in grade 10, I had the whole thing read. Hmm. Uh, because I was voracious for that type of information. We had a public library, but remember this was the day when you got one and a half channels on a black and white TV. Yes. And uh, so I used our local library. And people gave me books as gifts at Christmas and birthdays and things. And, you know, I remember reading Gone with the Wind when I was about 14 and was fascinated and the way was the fact that people were amazed that I'd read something that was over 1200 pages, you know. Mm. Um, 
so that was part of it. Then when I got to Memorial, I found that I really enjoyed the English courses that I was doing, and it sort of stuck with me there. And so I ended up majoring in English, but with a minor in history and political science. And again, the, the urge to learn. My interest in writing developed as a fluke almost, in that I got a job after university working with J.R. Smallwood on the Encyclopedia of Newfoundland Project. And I worked there for three years until he had to close it down. And actually it was because of working there that I ended up at working at Memorial. Uh, we did a lot of research at the Center for Newfoundland Studies in the old Henrietta Harvey Library building. And got, I got to know the staff of that building. By the time I ended work with the encyclopedia, they were in the new, the QE2 library, and they had gotten this year-long grant to hire people to organize the papers that Smallwood had given to the university when he retired from politics. And I said, well, I don't know anything about being an archivist. And they said, well, you've worked in an archives. I said, yes. They said, we can tell you what you need to know about an archives. We can't tell somebody else what you know about Smallwood. Right. So basically, I went there yeah. because of my subjective knowledge rather than my technical knowledge. And I found, I discovered quite happily that it, I found my niche. Do you have an interesting story about working with Joey Smallwood that you can relate? Uh, <laughs> yes. Mr. Smallwood loved Bristol cream sherry. Yes. Jeff Sterling, his good friend, used to give him a case every Christmas. Oh. But Smallwood was very much a Methodist. Mm -hmm. Right. So he would pop his head in around my office door and he'd say, has the sun crossed the yard arm yet, Mr. Riggs? <laughs> because he would not take a drink before the sun crossed the yard arm, which was 12 noon. Right. And then he would go and have a couple of glasses of sherry with his lunch. So I was, I, I enjoyed performing that function. Hmm. Because he, call, he used to refer to me as his fellow Methodist. Right. Um, Bert, uh, while, while we have uh, some time, um, I would like to, since you've been writing and researching Newfoundland history for so many years, um, I'd like to pick your brain, if I may, um, about some of the famous personages Newfoundland has produced over the years. Uh, first, can you tell me anything um, about John Anderson. He was a Newfoundland politician and he had some connection with daylight saving time. John Anderson was originally from Saltcoats in Scotland, came here and married a local woman, a Murray, and uh, came here first as, an, as a, an employee with Baird's, but eventually established his own company. And he got interested in politics and the betterment of the community as it were, so he was elected and served four-year terms on both the St. John City Council and in the House of Assembly at the same time. And then he was appointed to the Legislative Council, which would have been the Newfoundland equivalent in those days of the Senate. Mm -hmm. And he served there until about late 1920s. And it was during that time that he spearheaded the bill through the, the uh, introducing it in the upper chamber, the Legislative Council, with the support of the Premier, and it went through the, the House of Assembly and became law to introduce daylight savings time to Newfoundland, the, own, the first place outside of England that enacted daylight saving time. And he saw it as a way to utilize uh, that extra hours of sun, those extra hours of sunlight that were available during that time of the year, making it so that people weren't, you know, that it wasn't sunrise at four o'clock in the morning. Yeah. And now, of course, it's, it's an international uh, yes. event, yes. isn't it? Except in Saskatchewan. Right. <laughs> Except in Saskatchewan. Now, he um, had a couple of sons who uh, went on and achieved international fame. Um, the, the, I suppose the one who achieved most fame was John Murray Anderson. Yes. Tell John us Mur about John Murray Anderson. John Murray Anderson was the older of the two. He was born in 1894. 
and he uh, was educated first at Bishopfield College and then he went off to Edinburgh and finished his education, formal education, at the University of Lausanne in Switzerland. And when he came back, he, as many Newfoundland young males did at the time, young women too, he went off to New York where he saw, what he thought, an opportunity in the antiques trade. So he came back and he filled up a couple of containers with antiques that he had gotten around Newfoundland and went back to New York where his business turned out to be a flop, hmm. uh, surprisingly. But uh, he did encounter people from the theater industry in New York, which has you know, always been the home of great theater in, in the United States, mm -hmm. Broadway. And he ended up becoming a Broadway impresario, in a sense, of producing various, uh, particularly musical shows on Broadway. When Florence Ziegfeld, the great Follies producer, died, he was brought in to replace him. The Ziegfeld Follies was a yearly show. He, with a partner, opened a training school for young aspiring actors and actresses. And three that come to mind that, it, that he taught were Joan Blondell. Wow. Lucille Ball. Wow. And the one that became his lifelong friend, Betty Davis. Amazing. It was. Yeah. It was. He went off to Hollywood he, and uh, produced uh, a number of motion pictures out there. And he, he married, but there were no offspring. And in fact, he married, I think, a Bartlett from Newfoundland. Mm -hmm. And uh, he died around 1954. Did he do any performing himself? No, he was never on the stage himself. Ah, no. Always behind the scenes, Always producing or directing. Scenes. I guess. Yes. Yeah. 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 Now uh, his brother Hugh Abercrombie uh, Anderson, he uh, became a, a theatrical uh, luminary himself, didn't he? Yes, he had started out he, following the, the course of, you know, Bishop Field, Edinburgh, Lausanne, uh, with his, uh, as his brother had done. He was six years younger. He is mm, born around 1900. Mm. And he came back and was working in his father's business for a while. And the war broke out and he attempted to enlist, but his eyesight was so bad that he was turned down. However, since he was of the upper class, that was usually no stumbling block. So what happened was he ended up being admitted to the regiment as the payroll officer in the headquarters of the regiment in London. And he served there for the duration of the war. He received an MBE, the Military uh, Order of Merit, mm -hmm. uh, for his war service. And if you went through the records that, ex that have survived, and quite a lot of them have, of the members of the Newfoundland Regiment, there is hardly a personnel file there that does not have a letter, Dear Yui. Wow. Because um, everyone in St. John's would have known him, and mm. particularly, you know, there would have been the dear Mr. Dear Captain Anderson ones from the lower classes, but you know the heirs and the, the, those families all referred to him as Dear Yui, mm. and the Dear Yui letters to him and his responses, I think, would make a very interesting study on class and uh, involvement by those young educated men in the regiment. Mm. And in the war. Mm. Uh, Margaret Dooley. Before we step up, he wrote a book. Uh, well, he wrote a number of plays that his brother produced because after the war he went to Broadway too. And he wrote a book about his brother, and a, a biography called Out Without My Rubbers, <laughs> which was a quite interesting yeah. book. And I believe that Smallwood brought him back in 61 as one of the many Newfoundlanders who made good abroad that were brought back for the opening of Memorial University. Interesting. So sorry, I didn't mean to yeah, interrupt. Yeah, no, out, out without my rubbers, meaning out without my galoshes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, Margaret Dooley uh, wrote uh, several books 
um, the eyes of the gull, cold pastoral, and others, she was regarded by many as being Newfoundland's first novelist. Um, and I, I venture to say not very many people out there even know her name or have heard her name. Mm -hmm. uh, can you tell us a little bit about Margaret Dooley? Sure. Margaret Dooley was the daughter of Thomas Dooley, who was this, another, he was, he was from, I don't remember, who was Scotland, I think it was the north of England he was from. Came out here and started a business. Married Trefina Sofer, Sofer of Carboneer, and they had five children. Margaret was one of two girls. She was born, I think, in 1894. She had a sister, Gladys. Then there was Cyril, who is the father of Margot du Dr. Margot Dooley, mm -hmm. which is the only descendant with the Dooley name. Gladys had some children in North Carolina. Cyril fought in the war, was severely injured. Yes. Carried shrapnel around in him for the rest of his life. He died in the 1950s. Uh, Lionel was killed a few weeks before the war ended. And the third brother was turned down because of a heart condition for service and got white feathered by some well-meaning young woman. That was a, a program where they, they, there was this program that if women saw able-bodied young men walking around the streets who weren't in uniform, mm. they considered them to be shirking their duties and they would go up to them and pin a white feather in their lapel as a symbol of cowardice mm. without knowing the reason they weren't in uniform. Mm. Margaret had gone off to England after completing schooling here and spent some time at the, the Academy of Dramatic Arts there and perhaps with the, the mind, the intention of becoming an actress. But the war brought that to a, a close and she came back to Newfoundland where she spent the war period and the period following the war uh, doing good works as it were. She had been planning to marry uh, a young man from, who lived on the same street that she did. Uh, his name was Baird. And he had been injured in the war and he died on the same day that his, sister, his only sister got married. And the story is told how Margaret watched the funeral procession come from their house at Clifton down past her house on Rennie's Mill Road uh, to his final resting place. She began publishing books, novels, I guess writing was an interest of hers, in the early 19, the mid-1930s. The first one, as you mentioned, was The Eyes of the Gull, then Cold Pastorel, Highway to Valor, and Novelty on Earth. Those were the four that were published. With the thing, while there were other people in Newfoundland writing novels before her, hers were the first that were published internationally. Right. She was published by Macmillan, in Canada, she was published by Macmillan in the United States, and she was published in England. And in fact, Novelty on Earth was translated and published in a Swedish edition. Mm -hmm. uh, she, the fifth novel, which she had entitled Octaves to Dawn, was sent to her publisher, and it came back from the new editor that she had been assigned. And I guess she was a little not used to criticism or whatever, but she was so upset by the comments and notations on the manuscript that she threw it in the fireplace. Oh my gosh. A few pages have survived. They're with her material at the archives. Wow. But she never wrote another novel after that. Wow. She did, however, during that period, which is the early 40s, write two short stories, Sea Dust, which was about the Second World War, and what I consider to be her most perfect piece of writing is called Mother Boggan. It was a short story that appeared in Fort Lightning magazine. It's about a young man who was what today we would probably call attention deficit syndrome. Mm -hmm. Growing up in a Newfoundland outport in the late 1890s, early 1900s. His mother, his father is never in the picture. 
So he could have been lost at sea while the chap was still a, was still a child. And his mother dies in the summer of 1914. And he's at loose ends because she told him everything to do from when to get up, when to go to bed, when to brush his teeth, uh, how to tie his laces, uh, when to come in for meals, his right from his left. Mm. And now nobody was, there was no one to tell him what to do until a recruiting officer came around and he enlisted because here was someone who was telling him what to do. And he well, goes off to the war, he's at Beaumont Hamill, she says, uh, Dooley writes, where Newfoundlanders fell like nine pins, mm -hmm. which I thought was an, a very interesting mm -hmm. turn of phrase there. But he's never wounded, never hit, I think, because the moment that something's about to happen, his mother says in his head, Joel, come here. And he moves and the shell lands behind him, which is a very interesting, so he comes back, he ends up at the end of the war, appearing before a British medical board who assumed that he was suffering from what was then called soldier's hurt, post-traumatic stress disorder, because they didn't believe that any recruiting officers would allow someone with that phys men, physical and mental condition to mm. enlist freely. Mm -hmm. So they granted him a life pension, mm. which was 60 pounds a month, I think it was. And so he goes back to his old outport where he becomes, soon becomes the richest man in the community. <laughs> but the one thing that he wants, which is companionship, he can't get because he's got this sagging jaw and this reputation and all the young girls that he asked to marry him say no. <laughs> and I won't give the ending away. No, but, but it's I, a fascinating you, story. I teach it in. You made in me my, want to read it. <laughs> yeah, I teach it in my English course at Memorial. Yeah, great. And students like it. Um, I think we've got time for, for one more, um, and uh, this one uh, is, is, is really interesting to me because when I was a kid, I used to listen to a program on CBC on Sundays, and uh, it's, it, let me see if I can remember it. It, it, was, it was hosted by a lady from London, England, and it started calling from Britain to Newfoundland. Hello, Newfoundland. <laughs> Her name was Margot Davies. What's, what's the story uh, of Margot Davies? Well, we've got to go back to the father again. Margot Davies' father was, was David Davies, David J. Davies, and he came out to Newfoundland as a trade commissioner from the British government to Newfoundland. Trade was very a major interchange between Britain and Newfoundland at the time. And he was here for, must have been 30 odd years. Margot and her sister were both born here in the 1920s. And then he moved back to England and both the, the girls went over there. Uh, and her sister eventually married someone who was either knighted or a lord because she became Lady Baggy. And Margot never married, but she became involved in, with the BBC. She was a writer of fair repute, but it was this program calling Newfoundland from England or from Britain, whichever, that in a sense endeared her to the Newfoundland troops in the Second World War and to the people here because she was speaking directly to them. But more than that, this was not some limey with a British accent. This was Margot Davies from St. John's mm. that a lot of them knew when she was a little girl. Mm. And so she became quite the personality, the favored personality here. And her program went on well into the 1960s. Oh, absolutely. Because as, yeah. as, as I said, I, I certainly remember it. Yeah. She was, uh, it was interesting that George Wilson Knight came here. He was a British literary critic, came, made friends with her in England. He was a Shakespeare expert, wasn't yes. he? Yes. And they, they became friends, and he came here to receive an honorary degree from Memorial mm. in about 1982 and brought with him a sheaf of her poetry, mm. which he left at the library. It's in the archives where I worked. But also he arranged for these poems to be published. And that's the only part of her literary opus that has survived, which is really unfortunate because the poems are quite good. And if you can come across a copy, 
mm. in uh, in a secondhand bookstore, I would say get it. Mm. Uh, Bert, uh, we don't have very much time left, but before we go, uh, uh, one final question: You've poured over so many documents and artifacts, uh, you know, throughout your career. Is there one uh, artifact, one physical document that that you saw that just kind of bowled you over and and that you've always remembered and, and appreciate having seen it with your own eyes? Yes, there's not, but there's not one. Oh. One that, a couple that popped to mind, if you don't mind, is what we call, was cataloged as the Carolyn Withers album of watercolors. It was an album, I think it's 43 watercolor paintings of St. John's in the late 1890, in the late 19th century. Uh, and it was done by the famous artist of his day, William Frederick Rennie, for Carolyn Withers as a wedding present. And it is beautiful because it ha it's scenic of, of the old St. John's. Mm. And there are pictures there from before the fire. There's pictures of Oxen Pond Road. There's pictures of St. Thomas's Church, of Government House, of, uh, from various vantage points that you couldn't get now because they're all built up. Mm. So that is one that I really love. Well, thanks so much for being on the program, Bert. My it, absolute it, pleasure. Thank you so uh, much. Great chatting with you. And uh, perhaps someday we'll have you back. <laughs> well, I <laughs> appreciate more. that, sure. <laughs> Bert Riggs, ladies and gentlemen, and that's it for this edition of Carl Wells Point to Point. Thank you for watching. We'll see you again next time.